today's meditation is going to be led by Barbara Hill. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Well, in a few days, many of us will be celebrating Thanksgiving. And hopefully, we'll all be feeling thankful for many things in our lives. Because studies have shown that people who have a practice of feeling appreciation and gratitude tend to be happier and healthier. So feeling gratitude could be one of the easiest ways to improve our health and our happiness in our lives. So expressing appreciation to others makes them feel good. But have you ever noticed it makes us feel good too? Mm -hmm. When we give somebody an appreciation? Relationships filled with appreciation are always better. So now I invite you to relax. Fill your chair supporting you. Close your eyes if you wish. And take a nice deep breath. And as you exhale, allow yourself to let go of all your concerns and any tension you may be holding anywhere in your body. So within it, it with each inhalation, try to bring to mind something that you are grateful for. could be just being here in this warmth instead of in a cold, gray place. So in the next few moments of silence, let's begin a practice of bringing to mind people and things we appreciate and are grateful for. So with the sound of the birds can bring our attention back and realize that a regular practice of appreciation may improve and enrich our lives in countless ways. So have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank is John Scott Guy. He is interested in what is secular spirituality. And he's going to be talking to us about a book that he loved called Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality <laughs> Without Religion. He's going to present some ideas from this book, and he's also going to share us his personal journey of spirituality. He started his life in the Netherlands, grew up in Nova Scotia, he lived his life, his adult life in Alberta, and he's a member of the Lakeside Free thinkers, where he first heard the term secular Buddhists. Please welcome John. Who said you can't wear a tux to Lakeside? Eh? You can be anything you want. So this is my tux. But Sam Harris is a remarkable man. 
Uh, he was born in uh, 1967, which is uh, the 100th anniversary of the birth of Canada. He was born to a Hollywood couple. His father, Berkeley Harris, was a Quaker. His mother, Susan Harris, um, was Jewish by background. And I remember a show, I think it was in the 70s, called Soap. And uh, Susan Harris was the producer. Um, a successful Hollywood family. Sam Harris wasted his youth. At least some would say that, because he dropped out of university, he took drugs, and he spent his 20s traveling throughout the United States, throughout India and Nepal, studying Buddhism. And he was fortunate to have a mother who approved and supported and put uh, bread on the table. Uh, but Sam does not feel that he wasted his youth, so we'll come back to that. An amazing story. But I'm going to tell two stories today. I'm going to tell my own story and the story of Sam Harris. We would not want this just to be a book report. You can all read Sam's book. And the two stories will intersect at a point in time. <coughs> Sam Harris is remarkable. I'm ordinary. I'm average. I grew up in an immigrant family that was religious. Uh, my parents were Calvinistic Protestants, and children typically absorb the religion of their parents until we begin to think for ourselves. Uh, but I would not say that my childhood church experience was a spiritual experience. For me, church was boring. That, that's what I remember. I was forced to go to catechism classes. I hated it. Uh, there was nothing spiritual going on. I was doing what my parents wanted me to do. At age 15, my life changed dramatically. <coughs> At age 15, I was in my room with my transistor radio listening to, most of my friends listen to rock music, for some reason I like classical music, and on the station that I was listening to, a program came on. And that program changed my life. I heard a voice on the radio, or voices actually, the voice of Herbert W. Armstrong and Gardner Ted Armstrong. I suspect there are other people at Lakeside who have heard that voice or know people, maybe children, relatives, uh, who got in, involved with uh, a church led by Herbert W. Armstrong. Um, at 15, I lived at home, but I listened to this program I got their literature, read the literature, um, got involved. Uh, my parents became concerned that I was being pulled into a cult, and they took steps to prevent that, and they failed. Because at 18, I could do anything I wanted, and I knew more than my parents did. So I left home. I left home, and I joined, I joined a church called the Worldwide Church of God. Um, I now see that as a cult experience. At the time, I thought I and others in the church had God's true truth. We were unique. We, we had the truth. And I stayed in that church for 25 years. And unlike Sam, I didn't waste my youth because my mother wouldn't support me. I, I, I had to get a career. I became an accountant. Some would say that's wasting your youth, right? <laughs> you know, accountants are the kind of people that put all their bills with the heads facing the same way. <laughs> At age 30, Sam Harris decided to make something of his life. Um, he went back to Stanford University. You've got to be smart to get into Stanford. And he got a degree in philosophy. And he graduated in the year 2000. The next year came 9-11, and 9-11 had a big impact on Sam, it had a big impact on everybody. The world is different after 9-11. It motivated Sam Harris to write his first book called The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. 
It was a big success. Spent time on the New York Times bestseller list. And Sam Harris began to emerge as a public figure. He became known as one of the Four Horsemen. That's a group of four individuals uh, who reject religion and are seeking respect for atheists. I also made a transition um, after my 25 years in the cult. Things began to happen that led to my exit. In 1986, Herbert Armstrong died of old age. He was well into his 90s. And like many organizations that are built on a personality, on charisma, uh, his organization began to fall apart, it began to splinter. Uh, it stopped making sense. There was nothing that was bringing cohesiveness anymore. And in that environment, I began to question. Many people began to question. And uh, many people left or joined other organizations. Um, at that time, I re-examined a number of things in my life. I looked into the question again, does God exist? I came up with a different answer. I couldn't decide. I looked at the arguments one way and the other, and I could not confirm to myself that, yes, God does exist. Uh, I couldn't prove it either way and became an agnostic. Uh, I do look back, though, on my years uh, in what I now clearly see as a cult, and I describe it as a net positive experience. That's puzzling to people who uh, seem to make a living out of attacking religion. Uh, and there are cults that are very destructive. I see the Worldwide Church of God more as a benign cult. Uh, very controlling, and in that sense it's very cult-like. Uh, but it's not in the same league as the destructive cults. Uh, a couple that come to mind are Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, Heaven's Gate gives new meaning to uh, keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> dark, dark humor. But there are, there are those very destructive cults, but there's lots of organizations that are cults or cultish uh, that are relatively benign. Uh, the reason I say my cult experience uh, was a net benefit in my life because it was a crutch. And it was a crutch at a time I needed a crutch. And better to walk with a crutch than fall flat on your face. True. And, you know, and whatever works for you, right? Uh, uh, and I had some challenges as a young man and finding my way in life. We only get one journey through life, but it's not hard for me to imagine where I would have fallen flat on my face. And who knows how my story would have gone on. So... Uh, yes, this organization was a crutch, but a, a, a useful crutch. But at midlife, if you're dragging along a crutch, it's a burden. And there's a time to let go of your crutch. And I did that at midlife. And I entered the third stage of my spiritual journey. First was childhood. Calvinism meant nothing. Occult experience which was a deep experience, but not one that I would say was deeply spiritual. My third stage was, wait for it, nothing. <laughs> I was done with religion. Uh, I wasn't interested in spirituality. So I, I described that 20 years after midlife to retirement as my, my nothing stage. Um, uh, I was done with cults and religion, and we might ask, what's, what's the difference between a cult and a religion? About a hundred years. <laughs> uh, something in this period of nothingness, what did I focus on? Well, I focused on my career. That, that's what you do when you're in the working world. It sucks the life out of you, but you know, it takes a lot of energy, and prepare for retirement, and enjoy some of the pleasures of life, and that's life. It was not a time, uh, there wasn't a lot of time and energy to, uh, to look at what was going on, but during this period of nothingness, there was a bit of a void, a, a nagging 
empty feeling. Not serious, because, you know, all my energy was going into my work, trying to survive in the workplace. Um, I'll go back to Sam's story. We'll go back and forth between the two stories. Sam wrote a couple of more books, also became be bestsellers. Uh, he went back to uh, university to get a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, cognitive neuroscience, studying the brain, studying thinking. Uh, a very challenging field, and Sam Harris is a very smart man. Um, he established himself as a science writer, as a public intellectual, and as an unapologetic atheist, and continued um, building quite a public persona. Then came 2014. Uh, he turned some heads last year. He turned some heads by publishing his latest book, and that's the book uh, that I want to talk more about, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. And it too became a bestseller. Uh, he, he says in the book that and he wanted to do several things. One, he wanted to be provocative, and he certainly is that. And he wanted to stimulate a conversation, and he has succeeded on both of those things. Uh, but he has lots of opposition. He gets it from both sides. Religious people tell Sam Harris, leave spirituality alone. That belongs to religion. Yes. <laughs> Put an exclamation point on that one. <laughs> you know, there are religious people who think they own spirituality, and Sam Harris says no. But he gets it from the secular community as well. He gets it from some who say there's no such thing as spirituality. Why are you doing this? They ask Sam Harris. And I think in his book he quite successfully uh, addresses both opposition from both sides. Uh, I'll read you a couple of quotes uh, from the book, short quotes. Sam Harris says, scientists, and he is uh, a scientist, at least has a scientific background, scientists generally start with an impoverished view of spiritual experience. Many of them deny there is or can be such a thing. Spirituality, Sam Harris says, remains the great hole in secularism, humanism, rationalism, and atheism. And that resonates with me and, and a number of people who have a secular worldview. There just seems to be something missing at times, that science and reason and all these other things don't quite fill. Okay, back to my story. In 2012, my wife and I, uh, by the way, I met my wife uh, in the cult that I belong to, so good things come from cult experiences. <laughs> I had to say that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean it. I mean it. Um, in, in, uh, in 2012, we moved to Lakeside, and like a lot of people, we explore activities. Try this, try that. Uh, try open circle, if you like it, you keep coming back, right? Uh, this is one of our favorite activities. But you try things, and some things you try once, and let them go, and some things you stay with. I joined a group called the Lakeside Freethinkers, um, and I'm not going to say much about them, except um, one particular meeting last year that somebody said something that just struck me the right way at the right time. And that's where I first heard the phrase secular Buddhism, uh, which a number of the uh, Lakeside Freethinkers are, uh, are quite interested in. And it was about this same time that Sam Harris's book was getting a lot of publicity. Uh, it wasn't out yet, and people were already debating the book before it had been released. Uh, you know, people were taking sides. Uh, I bought the book. I bought the book about three months before it was released. You know how you can do that? Technology is marvelous. You buy the Kindle edition, you pay for it. Uh, they have your, your tablet 
And when the day is released, there's the book on your tablet. Automatic. Wonderful technology. Uh, so I had it on the day of its release, the uh, electronic version. Um, so just hearing the phrase secular Buddhism struck me and I wanted to explore it and Sam's book came out and he was a well-known figure so uh, I decided to read the book and so I would say last year possibly marks the beginning of stage four of my spiritual journey uh, because nothingness doesn't work for me anymore and I got lots of time now in retirement to think about stuff and uh, where do I want to go in the next 20 years or 30 years if we're lucky uh, we don't know uh, so I am now exploring what does spirituality mean to me uh, uh, and I define it as a secular approach uh, even secular Buddhism is a bit too narrow for me at this stage but I'm just exploring. Uh, if you're into self-help, this is called growing by casting yourself adrift. You know, you just want to get out in the ocean and bob around and see what shore you land on, because you don't know exactly where a journey can take you. Uh, so I'm, I know I want to go further with this journey. I have no idea where I'm going to end up, but I'm going to explore. I'm going to uh, look at some more of Sam's ideas. Uh, spirituality is one of those terms that has no precise meaning. You, you can't define it. It's kind of a bundle of ideas uh, and it means different things to different people. Uh, I will read Sam Harris's definition. Sam Harris describes spirituality as the efforts people make through meditation, psychedelics or other means to fully bring their minds into the present or to induce a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Uh, that's his particular definition and, and Sam has a very interesting attitude towards psychedelic drugs which he took uh, quite a bit, uh, ecstasy and others. Uh, he now has Two, two children, two daughters. Uh, he's on the public record. Imagine, most of you are probably parents, you're all children. Amer imagine a parent saying this to their daughters. Sam Harris hopes his daughters take psychedelic drugs. But this is a man who understands the brain better than most people, the, the organ, the brain. Now, he wants their, his daughters to take it in a responsible manner, in a safe environment, surrounded by people who know what is going on, but he looks back on taking drugs, uh, having a positive impact on his life, and he wants his daughters to have that, uh, that experience. He, he sees his drugs uh, in his 20s, teens and 20s, as a net plus in his life. It's remarkable, particularly for somebody who is an expert on the brain. Uh, that is not going to be part of my spiritual journey. <laughs> I have no desire to take psychedelic drugs. No problem if people want to go down that road, but that's not for me. The meditation part definitely does interest me. Uh, the science behind meditation grows and grows. People's experience uh, is well documented. Uh, I've become convinced. I'm sorry. Uh, is Lee Carson here today? Sorry? Lee Carson? Say again. Lee Carson. Is Lee Carson is here today. No. No. Okay. Thank you. Should have reached for the water. Well, he was. Uh, where was I? Uh, meditation. Meditation. Yes. Um, and there's lots of evidence, but you can only read so many books and so many articles. At some point, you either decide I'm going to try this and learn from my personal experience. There are things you can only learn from personal experience. Uh, and it is my intention to, to go down that path and see where it takes me. Um, the, the term spirituality is problematic. It, it's one of these terms that pushes buttons and people get all excited. Uh, and it, it causes an us versus them reaction, which kind of is 
doesn't make sense if you're talking about spirituality to get into a us versus them. I want to come at it just a little bit different. Um, we know a lot about the human brain, and we know we all have minds. But scientists do not yet know how the brain generates a mind. That is still a mystery. Science may solve that mystery, and they're working very hard on it, but it remains a mystery. Uh, and there's different schools of thought on this. And I certainly don't have all this figured out, and it's not easy to study in this area. But one analogy that I like is think about water. Water. Um, water is reducible to oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so you can, you can change water from one form to the other. Um, but when you reduce water, uh, the water disappears. You have two gases. The liquid is gone and you have gases. Uh, so you cannot reduce water uh, down to its uh, parts, oxygen and hydrogen, because when you do that, the water is gone. Hydrogen. Um, hydrogen. What did I say? Nitrogen? <laughs> no, it's oxygen and hydrogen. I taught chemistry in high school. I'm, I'm sure of that one. Um, I think I'm sure. Be careful. Any H2O, yes. Um, so, perhaps, so perhaps our minds are like that. That when you reduce your mind to brain function, and there's a lot of good science in that area, but perhaps the mind cannot be reduced. Perhaps the mind is somehow something non-physical that emerges uh, and you cannot reduce it back to its physical uh, constituent parts. But uh, the science there is uh, still not at a point where we know these things for certain. Uh, but a lot of good research. So you can think of spiritualism as a bit like mentalism. You know, mental activity in the mind. <laughs> the word mentalism is more problematic than the word <laughs> spiritualism. So we'll leave that alone. But the idea, might, there might be something to that. So there does seem to be some kind of a reality beyond the physical. That, that's kind of the essence of, of spirituality. Okay, so what I have learned from Sam Harris is the importance of mindfulness meditation, him and many others. Another thing I like about what he says is the value of subjective experience. Um, we, we live life by experiencing it. We experience it in our heads. We sort of live in our heads. That's, that's where we think we are, in our brain. It isn't quite that simple, but that's the feeling we have. Uh, what is life without our subjective experience of life? So if you think of life as a journey in your head, a mental journey, that means life is a spiritual journey in that sense. Another aspect of spirituality that resonates with me is mystery. Scientists don't like the word mystery, and that's good because trying to solve mysteries, take the mystery out of things, we learn a lot. That's one of the great benefits of science. But I personally feel it's a mistake to think that science will eliminate all mystery. Uh, we may never understand how the brain generates a mind. It's worth to pursue that in research, but will science succeed? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's fun to watch. Likewise, will we ever figure out how the universe began? Uh, there's lots of theories, but uh, is it provable? And for those who like science, you just ask the question, what came before the Big Bang? And we won't go any further down that road. I'll just say, that's a mystery. And um, another aspect of spirituality, uh, and it's not the only way, but it's, it's a path for self-help, for changing ourselves. Uh, religion offers that. Uh, there's a number of paths. Uh, so if you're interested in growth and change and in retirement, uh, it's never too late to change. Uh, spirituality seems to be another vehicle to go 
deep down that road. Spirituality is about connections between people. Uh, I, I find it interesting that uh, we have spiritual seekers in all over the place, it seems, but they seem to be wanting to work together uh, on solving problems like climate change, a pretty important problem. But we need a way to, for people to connect. And uh, there are some things in the direction of, of spirituality that allow a connection amongst human beings that can actually be very useful in, uh, in, in solving important problems. I've got to leaf through my pages because I think I want to come back to something. And my pages are not in order. The is retired. Yeah, things, things used to be so, so orderly. I uh, can't find my notes, but I'll just talk. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about worldviews. A worldview is the comprehensive set of beliefs through which you see the world. There can be religious worldviews, um, and within the religious worldviews, there's a number of different ones, uh, Christian, Muslim, Jews, Buddhists, there, there's a number of religions. So your, your main way of seeing the world is your worldview. There's a secular worldview, which is my worldview, and there is a spiritual worldview, which is different from a religious worldview or a purely secular worldview. So, uh, I'm interested in spirituality, but I just decided that last year. So I, I still see myself very much as secular. Uh, but I'm open to, open to wherever this journey takes me. I'd like to meet myself 20 years from now. And what, I wonder who that's going to be, because I'm certainly not the same person I was 20 years ago. <clears throat> so I expect I won't be the same person 20 years from now. I just don't know who that's going to be yet. Because, you know, you, you, you know what, what's the saying? Uh, journey starts with a first uh, thousand steps or something like that. <laughs> um, one, step. one of the difficulties with worldviews is a clash of worldviews, you know, uh, and it gets quite intense. It goes to war. We have war in the world now uh, between radical Muslims and the rest of the world. It's pretty serious when our worldview causes that kind of a clash. There's a clash between Christians and atheists. There's the one worldview that seems to have less conflict is the spiritual worldview. I'm thinking of people like the Dalai Lama. I know he's Buddhist, but his worldview I would describe as spiritual, and there's, there's others like that. Even Sam Harris uh, is a polarizing figure. Uh, I don't like that about him. I've learned a lot from him, but wherever he goes, he divides people. And there's something about people who are really, and he's very secular, he's very interested in, in, in uh, secular uh, spirituality, but he causes division. And what I've observed is it seems to be people who primarily have a spiritual worldview, whatever that means, it means different things to different people, where there is less polarization, there is more connection between people, um, and there's, there's less hostility. And, and that appeals to me, you know. We don't want conflict. We can't avoid it sometimes. Um, but there is a connection between conflict and worldviews. Uh, so what was Sam doing last month? I, I kind of follow his life a little bit. Uh, last month, the month of October, he was a speaker at the world's first mindfulness summit. Um, this was uh, an online summit, and it went every day of October. So there was a different presentation uh, every day, and Sam was one of the 31 presenters. Uh, I haven't, I haven't uh, looked at the presentation because you're going to pay $149 to have access. It's, there's a commercial aspect to it. So you can read about it, but, I, but uh, I did read about it, and I looked at some of the speakers. There were actually five or six names that I recognized when I went through the 31 names. 
Uh, Dan Harris. Dan Harris uh, wrote the book 10% Happier, uh, which I also read. W wonderful book. Um, uh, good, just solid book that you would expect a hard-nosed reporter to write. He's also very much into meditation. Uh, uh, Joseph Goldstein. I'm far enough along my journey to know a little bit about him. Arianna Huffington, uh, a business person. Um, uh, she's kind of an interesting story because uh, she had a wake-up moment, literally. Uh, a turning point for her is uh, she was sitting at her desk working, an extremely hard-working woman. She, she fell asleep and she banged her head on her desk. <laughs> like, it was literally a wake-up moment. But when you work to the point where you fall asleep, at, you know, that's, it's time to wake up. And she's saying some interesting things now. Uh, Dan Goldman... Uh, another name I recognize, a very prominent one uh, on spiritual matters, John Cabot Zinn. Mm -hmm. Zinn. Uh, one of the challenges with secular spirituality or any kind of spirituality is there's so many teachers, there's so many paths. That, that's kind of exciting because you've got to find the path that works for you. Uh, there's a thousand people that will tell you this is the path. Uh, a lot of them will say, you know, it will cost you that much. <laughs> I know what I'm tithing. Been there, done that. <laughs> if, if your solution costs money, uh, I'm not your customer. Um, I do want to find my closing quotes. There's one of them. How did these pages get so disorganized? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, two quotes to close, and then I would be happy to answer questions. And I, I'm really not at all sensitive to questions about my cult experience. I'm quite comfortable talking about it uh, and quite willing to, to share any details uh, about that. It seems to fascinate pe people for some reason. Um, so I welcome questions. Questions are scary, because you never know what people are going to ask. But you can always deflect the question, right? Uh, that's a speaker's technique. Uh, a closing quote from Sam Harris. Uh, I think this quote says so much. The paradox is that we can become wiser and more compassionate and live more fulfilling lives by refusing to be who we have tended to be in the past. I so refuse to be an accountant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but we must also relax, accepting things as they are in the present, as we strive to change ourselves. Uh, Pope Francis uh, says it very, very simply. Uh, another Pope, who seems to have some wisdom, who seems to be resonating with people far beyond the Catholic Church. He certainly has caught my attention. Um, Pope Francis says, life is a journey. When we stop, things don't go right. <laughs> so stop and wait for questions and things. Anyway, thank you for listening.
something I did which, which struck me uh, that a spiritual, a true spiritual pr practitioner is someone who has discovered that it's possible to be at ease in the world for no reason. <laughs> and um, so having thought about my reason for being, that struck me as something that I want to know more about. And then he goes on to define it, that such ease is synonymous with transcending the apparent boundaries of the self. And so my question is, is there no reason for being? And if it's a transcendency of ourself, where does it transcend to? Just to others or somewhere else? Uh, that's very, very interesting question. Uh, to get a good answer that, to that question, read the book, but I will comment on it. Uh, I cannot say that from personal experience I've ever reached what he describes in his book. Uh, he says he has, he has achieved that feeling of total peace, total harmony, uh, uh, twice or, or two, through two means in his life. Uh, he has had experiences with psychedelic, uh, psychedelic drugs where everything was at peace and that is one path through drugs. Uh, ecstasy, LSD, others. And he has had bad experiences but primarily he has mostly good experiences. And, and he reached a place where he says you cannot get there unless you do it, unless you take the drugs. You can get there that way. The second way um, is through meditation, and meditation of a particular kind over a prolonged period of time, and he says he has had the same result through meditation, but that it is much harder. Um, so I have had that experience uh, not at all. Uh, I don't know if I ever will, it's not a, a goal that I'm trying to reach, if it happens, it happens. But it is interesting, he's not the only one saying this. Many people who meditate say, yes, I, I reached a place where I just could not have got to otherwise. I, I still have a little bit of a void that I'm still dealing with. Uh, it's one of the reasons I go down this road. Uh, how Will I ever be able to say what Sam Harris says? I don't know. I, I just don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Meditating is, it's not easy to meditate in a way, uh, you learn to relax between your thoughts. Wow. Think about that. Think, see the Think about that for a moment. Try relaxing between your thoughts. Uh, so, I'm exploring, I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. Up here. Yeah, well. Uh, as we've known for a couple hundred years, the mind's in the pineal gland. Nevertheless, um, you talked about atheism and agnosticism and so on. When I took uh, Logic 101 about a hundred years ago, uh, they said it, it is impossible to prove the negative case. And that struck me, strikes me as being difficult thing between agnosticism and atheism. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an answer. Um, again, all answers are going to be incomplete because these are rather profound questions. Um, uh, let, me, let me talk about two kinds of atheists and then I'll talk about agnostics, which is how I prefer to describe myself. There are atheists who uh, say, I have no personal belief in God, um, but they don't dogmatically state, I am certain that there is no God. There are atheists who are uncertain, but they prefer to self-identify as an atheist, but without being certain. There are definitely atheists who, they may not say the words, but their behavior is such that they are certain there is no God. That, Richard Dawkins can say what he likes, but it comes across that way. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any doubt 
in his mind. So for some atheists, it's an open question. For some atheists, it's a closed question. Uh, again, I, I prefer to self-identify as an agnostic. For me, it's very much an open question. Uh, I don't know. I honestly do not know. Uh, that I, I'm certainly not certain either way. So rather than just two groups, I would even subdivide the atheist community into those who feel or act as if they are certain and those who do not. Thank you. I really appreciate your discussion. The word I want to focus on is secular. Because the people, the problem this whole thing, we don't know if there is or not a God, but we do know that there are people who say that secular means that you don't belong to my group. In other words, that's a religious thing. If you're in my group, then you're fine, but if you're not, you're secular. And this is, to me, the biggest problem that we have in this world. The lack of willing, you talk about people coming back and forth together. So too many people are the only way. And that's why this is such a tragedy. I, I, I completely agree with your comment. Um, if we could only find words that are not divisive. Uh, but how do we, you say, you say the word religion, it divides. You get into politics, it divides. Uh, even within spirituality, there are divisions. My spiritual path is better than your spiritual path. And, and we don't seem to have very many leaders in the world that rise above that. I mean, we won't get into U.S. presidential election politics. Where, where are the people in the world today that are using language that does not divide? They are very hard to find. I find the Dalai Lama is one of those people. Uh, but, you know, there are people who are quite divisive on, on, with him, he himself. So I'm looking for those kind of people, those kind of leaders who, who I'm a uniter, not a divider, you know, easy words to say. There just are not many people that I observe in the world uh, that, that do that. Uh, and it, I, I agree with you, it is one of the biggest problems the world is facing. We can't agree on anything. <laughs> and, we, and it gets us into wars. Just something I wanted to go over first and then, and then ask the question is about uh, three million years ago, uh, our ancestors were very much like us. The major difference being they had a brain half the size. The changing climate in North Africa uh, posed real stress on them and, and uh, resulted in the brain size growing for them to maintain themselves. Uh, about 250,000 years ago, uh, or a little less, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalus had evolved. That's us. And, uh, uh, and language had to evolve along with that. And until uh, they uh, had evolved a language that um, you know, that if becomes uh, essential, uh, can we can name for that. Uh, you cannot conceive of, uh, of uh, inventing a religion. Uh, but that came along. There are some races in the world today, or small groups, that haven't developed that aspect of language yet. Um, but uh, anyway, that evolved, and so they started to invent religions way back what were religions to start with and then more complex religions. And I'm kind of wondering, like I don't understand this uh, business of uh, spir spirituality, but uh, how does that enter this? Uh, and when? And another really good question. Uh, of course, we have no history before history. Uh, right? So what was going on? There's a lot 
there was a lot going on before we got recorded history. Uh, but there's some interesting speculation, uh, and when you look at the evolution of man before we have recorded history, uh, it, it's very hard to know for sure. There is a school of thought that as the brain was becoming bigger and as language be began to be developed, religions emerged. Why? Uh, for those who uh, seem intent on attacking religion, uh, it is possible that religion, which was there right at the dawn of recorded history, uh, evolved and possibly has some kind of survival advantage. Uh, because religion is in every culture, every history. There are aspects of religion right from the start of recorded history. And what evolution teaches us is the importance of those characteristics that facilitate our survival. So it's a reasonable argument to make that religion evolved to help us survive or prosper as a, 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 a being. Uh, now, there may be further stages of evolution down the road. Uh, we'd have to stick around a few hundred thousand years to find out. But, but it is intriguing that religion is obvious in every culture, mm -hmm. uh, in every society, it, 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 as man enters uh, recorded history. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was a great presentation. Roy Nolan, our dear beloved filmmaker, has made available all the tapes from the last seven years recording the conversations here, the lectures here. And if you would like to get one of them, if you remember, I like that one of August 2013. <laughs> you can talk to Roy. Pretty soon there's going to be a catalog available so you can look them up. They're 100 pesos each. Um, we appreciate that you're leaving your dogs home. We love doggies. It's not an anti-doggy campaign, but I just want to remind you, unless you need a dog as your companion, please leave them home. And I know we all love to talk after open circle and talk and talk and mingle and mingle, and we'd appreciate if you'd start to move it out to the other side of the fence as you can so that everybody can close up here. Please stack your chairs, get your coffee cup, and the board. Turn on your phone. Turn on your phone.